This is Irreversible Damage, Chapter 8. Uh, this one's subtitled the, the Promoted and the Demoted. This is more about, like, who is the golden child of the family and who is the lost or forgotten child. And in this case, we can probably for certain say that the forgotten children are the cisgendered, mostly we're going to be looking at the effect on uh, the transgender movement on women-only spaces, mostly. Uh, and how this, you know, this affects, like, even other trans people and lesbians and just young women in general. But the biggest problem that is presented within this chapter is that when it comes to biological men, no matter how feminine they think they are, who believe they are, uh, no matter how how much they've grown up with uh, femininity around them, just no matter how much just womanhood is surrounding them, they'll never understand what it's like to be a woman. And that's why there is issues with TERFs and, you know, uh, just pretty much mostly just women in general, I guess. It's not just the societal differences that men and women face, but it's also just biologically, like, men don't understand periods. They, they know that they exist, and they know intellectually that women have cramps and stuff, but they don't really understand the vulnerability a girl going through puberty is experiencing. And that disconnect that these biological men have is the issue largely with this trans movement. I'm not saying all trans women do this, but the most outspoken ones and the ones that even other trans people are like, I don't really like this person. I think they're doing bad. Like, those, that's the, those are the problem people. The other trans women are like, pretty much like, okay, like, uh, these ones understand that they are natal males and and with that understanding of their biology they pretty much just stay in their lane and so they don't wish to make other women uncomfortable they don't wish to invade women only spaces they don't even wish to make a big deal out of it they don't want to go public and go on to like, I don't know, BuzzFeed or something and be like, hey, I'm a, I'm actually a woman and I need these rights and blah, 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 blah. Like they're not doing that. They're just saying like, you know, I'm, I'm a human being and I understand that there are some things just about me that just don't belong in certain spaces. And that's, that's fine. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The forcing of one's way into the spaces that aren't meant for them, forcing others to change their language and the perception of gender, trying to be stealth or not, and forcing straight women to become uh, heterosexual or to force lesbians to become heterosexual, and blatantly not just under just not understanding that they are biologically male, and many women don't like that their rights are being trampled on. I can see many biological men not understanding this because men typically aren't as connected to their emotions and intuition as women are. Even if they're on estrogen, they still don't quite get it because they were raised as males and they very likely went through uh, male puberty. So you know, they were most likely very much raised as boys and boys, not all of them, but largely I would say they aren't held accountable for their actions. And so I can just see the way that boys are raised has bled into some of these um, uh, trans women. And I say trans women in quotations because we're talking about the ones that even the other parts of the trans community are like, oh, gross. I don't I don't like this, that this person is like getting so much attraction. And blah, blah, blah. I, I think I think we know what we're talking about. Abigail brings up 
two big transgender names to point out an interesting problem. Uh, so, Caitlyn Jenner and Christine Jorgensen. Caitlyn came out in June 2015 on uh, Vanity Fair um, as, as a transgender woman. She posed a massive problem for those who are already ad identified as trans women. Uh, some trans women had little to no problems when out in public before Caitlyn. Even using the toilets was no problem. And then after Caitlyn came out, they kind of just lost that, um, that kind of, not secrecy, but like unawareness of their presence. Because what Caitlyn did was she made it very apparent. Like, millions of people were watching her coming out, so therefore, tons of people who, who weren't meant to see these things saw it, and they were like, oh, well, now now I recognize what a trans woman looks like, and I don't like what they're doing for whatever reason, and I'm going to harass them, or even go as far as uh, commit homicide to them. And I don't necessarily think that that was Caitlyn's fault, per se. I think she did it very much on accident. I don't think she was thinking, Ooh, yes! <laughs> it's time for some people to die! Like, I don't think... I, I don't think that's what she was going... I don't think that's what she was planning on. But... Uh, so, suddenly, trans women like Crystal, who's in the book, um, uh, stood out like a sore thumb. People would be approaching her to hug her and say, I support you, literally, for the first time after Caitlyn uh, comes out very extremely publicly as trans. Uh, Crystal experienced anti-trans hate, which is pretty interesting. I just, I kind of wonder what the atmosphere was like for trans people before Caitlyn came out. I'm not entirely sure how exactly. I think it mostly has to do with, like, just the context of what was happening within uh, first world countries, you know, with, um, you know, technology and people can communicate really super quickly now, as opposed to uh, Christine Jorgensen's time, which was in, in and around 1953 when she came out as a uh, transgender or transsexual, if you will. Like, I don't think that's necessarily Caitlin's problem. Like, it's just, it's, it's just, that's what, that's the context of what's going on. And, uh, I think people were already very polarized at the time. And I think the entering in that polarization is why, uh, people like Crystal had experienced anti-trans hate. Because for some very strange reason, whenever it comes to politics, People are just at each other's throats, and it's kind of insane, but we're a topic for another day. <laughs> um, but when I was watching um, uh, Caitlin's interview with Diane, whatever her last name is, uh, on Vanity Fair, I, no I noticed there was like uh, kind of sad but moving music going on. And Caitlin was pointing out how she never cited it, but it was 41% of trans-identified people are have uh, attempted suicide, and these people die a lot. They like drop like flies. Is kind of basically what she was saying, and it was just like all so sad. And she's explaining her problems. Uh, before coming out and all that stuff, and while I was watching it, like, there was something very particular going on, and I, never once did she make trans people out to be, like, really, like, powerful people, like, you know, they're not victims, they're just like anybody else, and, and because of her approach, I think that's another factor into why people started being violent against trans people because in my view what had happened with oh trans people are victims blah 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 it just kind of shines this 
very stark spotlight onto the trans community and saying to laymen, hey, these people are really weak. Go beat them up. Not that that's what she was trying to say, but it just incidentally happened. I hope that makes sense. There's a term for it, but I don't remember what it is right now. Um, as I'm saying this, I don't mean that she like di like she did it on purpose or or she shouldn't have come out at all. I'm saying that you know she has every right to come out and say, "Hey, I'm I'm transgender," because you know that helped her in her personal private journey. And she was already such a big figure anyway, and she can't really do anything privately, so it makes sense what she did. But I just don't think her approach was necessarily the best. But it also makes sense because she had so much pressure going on. Famous people have it rough, okay? When presented as a problem needing to be ameliorated, transgenderism quickly entered the symptom pool. Which is what I was saying about, um... Like, when she was saying, like, oh, trans people, 41% uh, are victims of attempted suicide, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, oh, victimhood, victimhood. Oh, it's so sad. Look at my story. It's so, oh, pity me, basically. Again, I'm not saying she shouldn't have done it, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying, like, because of her approach of, oh, woe is us kind of thing as a whole species, woe is us. That goes into children's minds as, oh, I can really relate to that, and now I'm gonna apply your problems to mine, and apply your solution to myself as well. It, it's all about, it's mostly about relatability, and seeing, like, you're posing a problem, I feel like I can relate to this problem, therefore I'm going to be that. Again, I still don't fully understand what symptom pools are, but it, I'm gathering that if if it if it's surrounded by uh, morbid things and death, people are very attracted to it. That's all I can get out of it. And this posed a threat to parents because then their children would come out as transgender where they really aren't trans but homosexual or have a paraphilia and desire to be under the LGBA safety umbrella. With a greater awareness of transgenderism and the societal success they've had, it attracted the unwelcome attention of perverts and criminals, men using the good name of transgenderism to prey on vulnerable women, which uh, that's what I was saying earlier, uh, women, girls, and boys. So long as men like this take this course of action and relentlessly call themselves transgender, laymen are going to see the entire community as horrific predators with vile intentions. Which I think is a very important thing to keep in mind when people start talking, or rad femmes start talking about um, certain transgender issues. It's not necessarily just trans people as a whole, it's it's a lot of the issues do come with the predators, but it, it's more complicated than that. So now bringing up Christine Jorgensen, I, I really admire Christine actually. So she was once a GI who served in World War II, then went through the world's first successful medical sex change. In 1953, the vast majority of the attention on Christine was positive. She was welcomed by 1950s America, which would other, otherwise seem unlikely given that homosexuality and sexual deviance was looked down upon. I believe what made Christine so acceptable and um, less transsexual deaths were, were surrounded Christine was because she didn't victimize transgender people. I really, I really love this quote on her, on her plaque in, uh, I think it's San Francisco, I, th I think. Um, so she empowered these people instead of victimizing them, and she said, quote, the answer to the problem must not be in sleeping pills and suicides that look like accidents or in jail sentences, but rather in life and the freedom to live it. And I think I think that's way more empowering because she I, it, she never really seemed to dwell um, from what I've watched of her. She never dwelled on 
the negative side of things on transgenderism or transsexualism. She did acknowledge that transsexuals like herself were prone to suicide and were uh, incarcerated sometimes or often, I don't know, but her main concern was in empowerment and moving forward in life. She's trying to normalize it in a very admirable way, in my opinion. Uh, and she took it with a lot of grace, too. I don't think she really whined and complained very publicly, at least. Uh, I think whenever she went on, on, uh, on, her, on those talk shows and stuff, she'd always just present it very normal, very pleasant, and even though it wasn't exactly relatable, it was just like, she would, she, she just kept saying things like, just accept me for what I am. I think her approach was largely why the transgender movement has been so swiftly accepted in society. I believe the way in which she talked about her journey was what made others not, like, uh, you know, relate to her in the same way as Caitlin. Nobody else really came out and was like, oh, I suddenly think that I'm trans. Like, that just didn't happen because there was, there was that lack of relatability because there was no morbid curiosity that went along with what she was ever presenting. Yeah, so even though she had her struggles as a gay man and as a transsexual woman, she never she never really talked about it that much. So I believe in that way she wasn't exactly relatable unless you just so happened to be already transgender yourself and you've already like come out or something. Uh, I read more into Caitlyn's thing because of her coming out. Caitlyn's coming out, quote, um, at least 21 transgender women had been murdered in America in 2015, um, which is interesting because I have a, I have, I found a study where the, the, the years before 2015, there just wasn't really that many, uh, homicides, uh, more specifically against, uh, black and Latina, uh, trans women. And, and many, quote, trans people and their allies worried that increased exposure has given their serious struggles the patina of an overhyped fad, and I think that is absolutely true. Which, again, I don't think Caitlyn intended, but because it's just the nature of being so popular and famous, of course that would happen. Moving on to uh, uh, the lesbians in this case, which are now being forgotten. Like, uh, I've seen um, quite a few lesbians these days being like, the L is disappearing from LGBT. And so, although I believe Caitlin and Christine made a huge impact on society for acceptance of social and sexual deviance, especially for men, uh, for better or worse, they are biologically men, and biological men do not understand what it's like to be a biological woman. It's just, it's just a fact. And so, lesbians and other women are swept under the radar from this movement. Women-only spaces such as lesbian bars, their publications, women's only colleges, and uh, single-sex bathrooms and locker rooms, as well as prisons and women's shelter for domestic violence are now be being infiltrated by biological men or removed altogether. Knowing that biological men identifying as women in California are now able to be placed in women's prisons or female prisons, almost half of them being sex offenders compared with 19% of the prison population as a whole. Knowing that biological men identifying as women in British Columbia, Canada are now able to be placed in women's shelters, women's domestic abuse shelters. Women have the right to be concerned about this, but their voices are largely ignored in favor of trans acceptance. Or the place is just, the, the shelter is closed down altogether and just labeled a turf society or whatever the hell. Uh, the women who protest are labeled as turfs and are given death threats that apparently just aren't threatening enough to warrant protections because verbal violence and dead rats nailed to a door or more akin to a harmless word salad is what I, the impression that I definitely got from the articles that I read linked from this book. So Pippa Fleming, a performance artist 
and radical feminist, or just a feminist, I don't know. It didn't really specify. Uh, she told Abigail that in the mid-90s, quote, lesbians were thriving in America and lesbian culture was enjoying a heyday. Now lesbians have gone underground. Lesbian organizations have either disappeared entirely or they use vetting and background checks to bar trans women from forcing their way in on the grounds that they too are lesbians. This is the only way lesbians have been able to keep their meetings restricted to biological women. And I know that sounds very discriminatory, and it is by the definition of the word. And there's nothing really wrong with discrimination technically. It's when you're bigoted and discriminating. That's, that makes a difference. So in my opinion, I, think it, I believe it is very much critical for lesbians to get their own spaces and define their sexuality by the literal definition of homosexual, which is same sex. Because no lesbian wants to be duped by a penis, no matter how feminine that penis is declared to be. Having a space where you know everyone around you has a God-given vagina feels a lot safer because you have no idea if a biological man, even after bottom surgery, is going to be to come barreling in and abuse these women. You just never know. And I'm not saying biological men are inherently dangerous. It's just statistically, they just so happen to be more dangerous. And it just makes total sense for sex segregated spaces to be established, as well as lesbians having their own space. And it really blew me away, this part. The fact that in many high schools today, trans is a high status identity, while lesbian is not, and it is in fact derided as a lesser identity. This really goes to show how little anyone cares about lesbians, and butch for that matter. Quote, lesbian is a porn category is very appalling, to say the least. And that's just, ugh, I can't. Like, what, 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 so what are gay, what are gay men, like, what are their relationships, I just, why is it that lesbians have to be in the fetish porn category, whereas every other thing ever is, is totally fine, I think that's just ridiculous, like, women having relationships with other women, that's not, That's not for anybody else to enjoy. It's for them to enjoy, and maybe even other lesbians if they're into that sort of thing. And so moving on to um, uh, trans-identified males in sports, women's sports. Uh, uh, so these biological males are allowed in <clears throat> yeah, frequently now. They're allowed into girls' and women's sports. And it's not surprising when they show up in first place every time. Meanwhile, when they were identifying as men before, they were like, I don't know, like middling in, in you know, in the competition with other, uh, with other boys. Just because it comes with the label girl doesn't mean that the biology doesn't apply. And I just, I don't understand the logic here where it's just like, oh, well, you're calling yourself a girl and uh, we're gonna, you know, you're going on cross sex hormones. So therefore you're probably okay now. You're, you're like weak now. I mean, like, yeah, he's, he's gonna be weak against like other big beefy cis dudes, but he's like almost always going to be a biological female. And that, that's just how it is. It is high, extremely unfair. And yet, those who object to this unfairness, no matter how, like, significant, you know, popular, uh, outspoken this, uh, these uh, women are who speak out, uh, they are simply labeled as bigots or, you know, transphobes. And, and then what ends up happening is, uh, in this case, the example that I'm thinking of in the book is um, Athlete Ally, I believe, was being all like, mm, well, we got to protect the trans people. The trans people are way more important. 
than uh, your puny female voice, you know? It's just like, what are you going on about? It, it, from what, I, what I'm seeing here, they would rather protect the the uh these marginalized groups and push them forward and then when it comes to the women who and the girls who say hey i don't i don't want to compete with uh somebody who is will, will always be stronger than me and will always beat me i mean who wants to compete with that if every time you compete with someone and you lose why the hell would you bother continuing it so what happens is quote their private spaces of uh, the women's private spaces turn co-ed their sports records stolen and then they get like spat on you know by some people some of these trans women who are like oh well you're a loser if you can't beat me uh their protestations of unfairness shouted down as bigotry what about equality, equity, you know, like equity and fairness? What happened to that? Why is it that these other voices are more important than other voices? Why can't we just all listen to each other? Why can't we just sit together and compromise? Like, why is that so hard? Make a, like a trans sports team instead. Why don't, why don't you do that instead of just invading other people's? Ariel moves on to, you know, posing the question, what is a woman anyway? And, and now women aren't women anymore. Women are, it, well, women is a feeling. Uh, so uh, the archaic form of women, it was defined as an adult human female, and also defined by her biology, you know, her XX chromosomes, her, you know, her the lustrous vagina, uh, womb, ovaries, fallopian tubes, you know, stuff like that. Her ability to give birth, that's what defined a woman. And that's how we define female in the animal kingdom in general. So, I, I just, I don't know, man. Anyway, anyway but now... Now, the, the new, sleek, modern definition of woman is, I hate this, honestly, being submissive to someone else's desires, which therefore means gender is identified by how other people treat you. And that's really stupid. <laughs> like, it just sounds so like, I'm going to base my identity off of other people's opinions and thoughts about me. Men and women are also defined as social stereotypes. You know, they're typical, uh, they're, you know, stereotypical gender roles. And, uh, you know, the men are the GIs and the women are the Barbies. And it doesn't matter how flattering or unflattering these stereotypes are. Like, women are catty, you know. And, and men just bully people all the time. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what they are. That's what defines a man. Like, but that's the definition, apparently. And so, if you call a pregnant woman a pregnant woman, for instance, uh, you're excluding trans men who, who still have a womb and have fallen pregnant for whatever reason. A baby doesn't come out of a vagina. A baby crowns uh, from the front hole. That's what they're called. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that such a beautiful term? <laughs> no longer do we say, quote, menstruating women and girls, uh, unquote. We say, quote, people who, people who menstruate, unquote, because trans women, or trans men, trans women wish they would, don't they? Uh, trans women menstruate too. Um... Uh, women are referred to as breeders, isn't that beautiful, or bleeders, <laughs> which reminds me of um, Mad Max Fury Road with uh, the antagonist Joe and his five wives who were literally just there to give birth to people, um, which was, you know, not very pleasant to see. Um, the whole breeders and bleeders just sounds just so... It, it, it doesn't have that... 
it doesn't have a humanizing ring to it, let's say. What really rubs me the wrong way about this terminology is that it exclusively caters to the 1% of the population and ignores the voices of the, of the majority. So if you're going into like some kind of, what is it, Geno space, you know, mostly, you know, exclusively for, you know, women and, you know, their medicine and stuff, it's like, the majority of people coming in are going to be biological women and maybe very occasionally, like maybe like one in a million or something is going to be that one uh, trans identified female. It's like, why would you change your entire language and lexicon, you know, just to cater to that one person that's going to come in or two people that are going to come in? It's like, how do you think, like, what... It when a woman comes in and she's like, she has no idea what trans is, and then her uh, nurse or nurse assistant or whatever comes in, and then she starts saying like, oh, your front hole, I'm going to be like touching it, and then I'm going to put the, the thing in to check the, you know, it's like, it's so, it would be so weird to just have your vagina be called the front hole, or... Or like having a checkbox that says like, oh, are you a breeder? Like, it's, they, they would be like, what is going on? I'm, I'm not this. I'm just pregnant. <laughs> and so moving on a little bit, it's still within this section, but when discussing pornography, Sasha Ayad is brought up and she says, quote, in some cases, porn did play a big role in the, the children's new newly adopted identity. Abigail goes on about mild BDSM being a cropping norm amongst teenagers and how scary that is for young girls who are just getting into their sexuality. I think it is scary to see BDSM as a 12 year old girl and having this mounting pressure to mimic, mimic those women in porn to oppress the boys she associates herself with. I can certainly see a girl unwilling to call herself female if that's what she has to, to uh, if that's what she has to go through, you know, being a submissive female and, you know, like being choked and having her hair yanked on and probably sp spat on and, you know, other BDSM sort of things. Um, like, of course, she'd be like a little intimidated because that's what the boy she associates herself with like, totally expects. And uh, then I can also see like maybe, oh, if I'm a man instead, I can be the dominant one and that's a little easier because I'm not the one who's going to be like taking this stuff. It's easier in their mind possibly to be dominant. Although that's not what I was thinking, of course, but maybe some of them will think that. I don't know. Uh, moving on. Um, trans as inter as an intersectional shield. Um, so this one reminded me of that one uh, Joe Rogan Experience podcast episode where I don't remember their names, but they were talking about the oppression Olympics, the competitive victimhood, and grievance jockeying. And I'll have a link to that podcast below. I think the whole thing is actually quite interesting, so leave some time to listen to that one. And I mean, that's basically what Abigail's talking about, in a sense, but she just doesn't use the words directly, but it, it is what she's talking about. So, the least oppressed of all oppressed uh, is the straight white male, and just below him are straight white females. Uh, being either of these normies, <laughs> They're not literally normies, but you know what I mean. Uh, being these people is, or the set class, is boring and outdated. And they are often considered violent and oppressive, oppressive as well as being privileged. So, uh, not wanting to be a part of the group that the LGBTQ, disabled, and people of color exclude, which is the, the straight white male and female, uh, the straight white girls and boys in school identify themselves as transgender to be seen and to be special and reject that they are the oppressors because they are in fact also oppressed and one of them and 
quote, of all these badges of victim status, the only one that you can actually choose technically is trans because trans is something you can just claim that you are and then people will just be like, oh, I'm going to totally believe you. It, but uh, this excludes uh, trans species, other kin, trans disabled, and uh, trans racial communities. Although, if you are transgender while identifying as, say, a deer, uh, you get some oppression points. That's what I've seen. That's what I've seen. And I'm not really making a joke, it's literally what I've seen. <laughs> um, but it is kind of funny. <laughs> um, uh, the question is posed, quote, are students really identifying as a member of the LGBTQ in response to peer pressure? Unquote. Uh, the answer is unequivocally, yes, 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 they are. Um, according to Grace Harmon, half of the student body at Evergreen State University identifies as LGBTQ or is questioning, which is unbelievable, quote, when across cultures, LGB, and probably A, honestly, consistent asexual is what I mean by A, uh, when that consistently comes in at around 10%, and even that might be, like, kind of exaggerated, unquote. Uh, and this is said by a, a graduate from this college. Of course, the TQ end of things allows for that social status boost because that is the oppressor's only way in to having a successful social life. Claim that you're transgender lesbian and suddenly you have friends. Threatening someone's social status is one surefire way to make anyone claim uh, they're transgender. Because people want friends, because, you know, friends are very nice things to have. And when you go to a certain uh, space, be it a university or a club or whatever it is, like, you you go in there wanting to make friends, and if you don't have friends, your stress levels skyrocket. And so, if the way to make friends is uh, do as the Romans do, in this case the Romans are all uh, transsexual people, of course you're gonna try and be like, oh yes, I am trans as well. Yeah, because people are quite honestly very desperate when it comes to friendship and connecting with other people, even if those connections aren't super qualitative. They, they want it regardless. To start your term as a victim, you must first sacrifice your birth name, then the universities will take it from there. Universities like UCLA offer simple instructions and private uh, provide forms for making this change campus-wide. You can then easily change your sex marker while you're at it. Which is weird because, like, before it was so stinking hard, you had to pay quite a bit of money just to, just to get it all done. Nothing was for free, but at universities, <laughs> socialism. <laughs> Over a hundred universities cover transgender hormones under their health plans, while at least 87 colleges and universities cover gender surgeries. At Yale, the cost of testosterone for a natal girl under the school health plan is $10 a month. Knowing that today's youth has a wider familiarity with therapy, these youth fully trust these university counselors and psychoanalysts. So a stressed out of their mind, anxious, depressed, and with little to no friends student walks into their to these offices and then gets directed to the uh, sexual and gender identity issues department. Lo and behold, the student is given the trans card and all their problems make sense. If a concerned parent catches wind of such information, those parents, or that parent, is surely going to be escorted off campus as soon as they arrive. If the student is at least 18 years of age and can demonstrate the ability to give informed consent, although, you know, having crippling depression, generalized anxiety disorder, or some other kind of mental illness uh, that causes any kind of obsessive thoughts and evasive, invasive thoughts, uh, perhaps having a psychotic episode or in a manic state from bipolar disorder, for instance, 
that has no bearing on this ability at all. Well, basically, if your student is just in therapy, regardless how effective the help is, she or he qualifies as able to consent to transitioning, and there's nothing the universities or parents can say or do about it because that young adult knows themselves best and the universities must simply ac accommodate. Uh, I feel like this chapter really speaks for itself, so I'm pretty much just going to end it here. All right, well, uh, hopefully I'll see you next week around the same time. Uh, we're almost done, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> All right, bye.